But then they messaged me back in the same moment and said, nice username, by the way. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh shoot. <laughs> I had not changed just like my telegram name from John Hammond. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was odd in the moment, like, wow, my goodness, this is a horribly embarrassing OPSEC fail. I uh, have to totally re- return my security professional card. <laughs> but they came back and said, hey, if you are John, like, hey, I really like your stuff. You put out some cool content. Welcome to Needle Stack. I'm your host, Jeff Phillips. And I'm Shannon Reagan. Today, we are talking to John Hammond. Uh, John is a cybersecurity researcher, educator, and content creator. He currently is on the threat operations team at Huntress, amazing company. Uh, He's a former DOD Cyber Training Academy instructor and current uh, cybersecurity YouTube star and sensation at underscore John Hammond. It is an awesome channel. Go check it out. We will put a link in the show notes. Uh, And with that, John, welcome to the show. Goodness. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me join you. Very excited to chat. Yeah, just a gentle, gentle intro to your uh, illustrious background. Um, So speaking of your YouTube channel, Jeff and I have both been digging around. Um, You are awash with great tips and tools, um, lots of, you know, recommendations and, you know, demoing the tools themselves. Uh, One of the things Jeff and I have been talking about lately is in the threat intelligence, security research, threat hunting space, there are tons of tools. There are, you know, lots of automation. Now there's the advent of AI. Could you speak to the importance of, of the human in the loop uh, in using open source information uh, to go out there and get the full full story and the full context to put together intelligence? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I am a firm believer that at the end of the day, it's kind of just us that makes the decision that that calls the shots on, hey, what happens here, where, there, um, and it, that requires people that requires humans in the loop. Uh, I work with a whole lot of like managed operations and, and security operations center. Uh, and we're looking at malware. We're trying to track down hackers and threat actors and adversaries. Um, and look, whether we make the decision, Hey, are we going to uh, quarantine or isolate this host is, is something so bad that it requires this break glass emergency or whether we're, I don't know, going after a threat actor or trying to understand who is that adversary? Can we figure out some attribution? It's really tough to let a machine or a robot or AI, however we want to, however we want to put that in a bucket. Uh, I think we got to be part of the equation and people still need to be part of the decision-making process. No, for sure. I, um, you know, we actually talked about uh, offline some memorable, memorable moments um, you've had engaging with threat actors and remember, you know, just like we need a human in the loop, on this side, um, that remembering that um, there are people as well uh, on the the threat actor side, despite whatever technologies they might be using. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how does, um, you know, when you're doing reconnaissance on a threat actor, um, how do you keep that in mind um, as you're looking at their tactics? Are you are you using OSINT to understand something about the person as well as the, you know, the, the TTPs, the tactics and techniques and procedures they're using in their cyber threats? Absolutely. And it, it really varies case by case. Um, but any other intel or information, again, that open source intelligence, you can track down on either, hey, maybe the uh, adversary that you know you're up against with their trade draft or their attack chain, or if you, I don't know, are going out and performing some of the investigation and trying to dig in deeper, you might actually strike up a conversation <laughs> with that <laughs> ill-intended actor. Hey, if you could, I don't know, get in touch with them. And that's odd and weird and interesting. But with that, yeah, if you just understand their persona, um, where they're coming from, we have a lot of strange conversations on um, APTs, right? And that's uh, advanced persistent threat is how we might typically consider that acronym. But I, I hear a joke every now and again that that could very well be an advanced persistent teenager. Because, <laughs> hey, there are, there are some threats out there that, you know, are uh, maybe younger generation and, and they're doing some wild stuff. But communication with them and what they're persona might be. A lot of them might be selling malware or access tools, hey, stuff to do the, the hacks and compromise that they do. Uh, if that's in a marketplace or if they're off in Telegram, look, they might be sending GIFs and memes in a weird, wild sense, or they might just be really like 
proud to showcase their product. Uh, and it's genuinely a product, bear in mind. It's a whole blown industry and enterprise mm -hmm. and all that they're up to. I was going to ask um, if there's any stereotypes, um, you know, if you're dealing with folks, if they're, if they're Russian hackers or uh, from the Russian underground versus US based or the, uh, any stereotypes about their personalities and what it's like to engage with them? Uh, well, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know if I can speak to this with a thousand percent certainty because look, attribution at the end of the day is hard. And in a lot of cases, it, at least especially for hey, businesses or organizations facing a threat, they don't care. They just see that's evil and they want it out of their computer networks. But I, I, I hear and I do get to banter in some of those strange and spooky telegram chats. Uh, but VX Underground or other sweet, incredible threat intelligence firms or folks that chase this, <laughs> I've heard them say, yeah, maybe in some Russian environments, they're a little bit more matter of fact. They're a little bit more down to business. They're all serious and they'll just get straight to the facts. Um, but in other circles, maybe they are a little bit goofy. They are a little bit weird. They are trolling and memeing and totally human they are they are a person at the end of the day yeah brush up on your means before you go on <laughs> to engage with the friend. <laughs> um actually i know it sounds uh, silly but hey yeah reality it's too. not yeah mm -hmm. um endear yourself um on on a similar vein um you know you're gonna be you know potentially purporting to be you know of this community um we are very uh, delicate in our talk around uh, sock puppeting uh, in Authenticate mm. and on Needlestack, but it is really a fact of life and security research and other OSINT fields. Uh, how how critical is that for you to, to do your job and to gain that context? Um, and are you using, you're obviously using it to gather OSINT. Are you using OSINT to inform like how you shape those sock puppets and how you kind of, you know, assume a certain, certain persona? Absolutely. Definitely. Um I truthfully tend to think, hey, whatever you can do to put a barrier between this online persona you might be acting as and your true real self, your identity, is a good thing for your own, your own privacy, for your own risk, for your own security and anonymity that you might pour in the mix there. Um, so I know, hey, maybe a sock puppet is a hot topic, but uh, at the end of the day, it, it will help. It will it will put that barrier up. Uh, and if you can, oh, fake your name, fake a picture, fake your background, your, I don't know if it ever comes to it, maybe some information, the address, the phone number, anything that you could just really build the full picture of a person that you can play the part as, that could help with some investigations um, and open source intelligence. When you put that in the mix, it's odd and interesting because would you ever consider maybe impersonating to a certain extent, someone else? Uh, could you act as that? And maybe that could be a foot in the door in some certain scenarios, <laughs> trying to be politely vague in that. Uh, <laughs> but I do think, Hey, you know, maybe that is, it's one way forward, and there are a whole lot of things that can help with that. I try to look for those tools that can give me, hey, here's a fake persona, here's an identity, here is uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I know that might be a hot topic, and we don't need to drill down too far. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, are there any any instances where you're going in as yourself, or is that just an absolute no-go? Oh, yeah, this is a bit interesting. And if you don't mind, I'd love to share uh, a certain anecdote, a little bit of a story, mm -hmm. because truthfully, I have this YouTube channel and I have this online uh, activity and presence and it's my name. Like there's no secret. Hey, I, I just go by John Hammond. And you put a little profile picture up. It's me, mean mugging, cheesing with the red hair and glasses. Pretty identifiable. Hard to miss. Uh, so I am. I, yeah, candidly, I am a walking dox. <laughs> a joke that I make, but uh, a certain truth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so while I was kind of trying to make some sense out of a new um, little trick or trade craft that threat actors were using with Windows shortcut files and not to get too nerdy, but they were selling this capability out on some of those cybercrime forums. Think XSS or exploit.in, breach forums, the list could go on and on. Uh, and I reached out on Telegram to this uh, builder and their support line and said, hi, I'm curious. I'd like to be able to by your tooling, uh, how do I make that happen? What do I need to do? And they would had uh, explained, look, hey, we do Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, whatever. You can make a transaction here. We use 7% for transaction fees, yada, yada, yada. Um, 
And I was realizing, oh, goodness, I'm not super duper smart on cryptocurrency. Maybe I don't think I could run down this rabbit hole. But then they messaged me back in the same moment and said, nice username, by the way. And I thought, oh, shoot. (laughs) I had not changed just like my Telegram name from John Hammond. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it was odd in the moment, like, wow, my goodness, this is a horribly embarrassing OPSEC fail. I uh, have to totally return my security professional card. (laughs) But they came back and said, hey, if you are John, like, hey, I really like your stuff. You put out some cool content. I was like, this is so weird. Now I'm just having a conversation with some actor that, I don't know, watches my YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Silly thing. Um, but they said, hey, if you are who you say you are, if you actually are, after I acknowledged and fell on my sword, this is weird and embarrassing. Uh, I caught in the act, caught red-handed. They said, look, if you are somehow able to prove it, then I'll give you the builder for free. And I'll tell you a little bit about the cybercrime underground, the marketplaces that I'm selling at. And I was like, wow. This is this is weird. This is wild. Um, so I, I, I took a silly picture of like a, a note card or an index card on my desk that I said, like, hi, builder support and sent the picture. Um, so, again, maybe a, we'll, we'll put this with a grain of salt. I don't know if that's OPSEC practices that we want to put into place, yeah. um, but they shared the tool and they sent me some other telegram access, other accounts that they might have gained access to and. It was very weird. It was a very strange scenario, but I uh, am cognizant. Maybe that's a reality. People just as well, seeing what's out on the world for education or for training, they might incorporate that into what they do just as well. I think this is only a tactic if you have a million subscribers. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, your mileage may vary. (laughs) Can, Can we go down that path a little bit more um, for, you know, as a threat intel analyst. So in that particular instance, um, you were looking to get access to a builder. You wanted to understand it more. Can you talk a little bit more about, again, whether it's with a sock puppet, you're in these forums, what, you know, what are you looking to glean by lurking in some of these places um, or signals that you're looking for? Um, You know, what kind of information are you looking to gather by, being here and and as compared to what you might get in your feeds as a threat, you know, you have threat intel feeds. Like why, why spend time in there? What, what are things you can pick up that are helpful? Yeah. Um, and maybe this is a bit too zoomed in or narrow. Uh, cause my, my first, my first immediate answer is look, anything that I can glean some insight on or just have for the information or just have for even the screenshots of look, look at the conversations that they're having here. This is mind blowing and sometimes really good for showing the rest of the world what actually happens. Uh, But uh, again, a little bit more pointed, just from my security research perspective, I am curious, hey, are they going to share any of their tooling will they will they offer their executable or do they give out their malware sample or they do they give a free trial or do they have some other videos or demonstrations of what they're up to that i could see and i could observe because ultimately the crown jewel for me is and again this might be specific to security research but like what are the artifacts that get dropped with that tooling what are the things and behavior that are things that we might be able to look catch on to and, and use as a key identifier for detection or for understanding of what that threat vector is. Um, those are all the things that I am especially interested in, but I'll add the disclaimer. A lot of times it's casting a wide net and just trying to see everything that they're willing to share. If they spill the beans, Hey, that's pretty cool insight. I really liked, um, there was one of your videos on uh, like dumpster diving on the dark web. And it was, <laughs> it was great because you could just kind of see, I, I think it's really nice the way you show like the dead ends as well as the, you know, aha moments. Then it's like, what is this? You know, or you're, you're learning, you know, nomenclature as you go, is this the same thing as that? Are they calling this, you know, this by this name and this group or whatever, um, just kind of running down the list uh, to, follow those threads not all of them pan out um but it doesn't mean that they're not valuable to pursue i think that's great how do you show that that's something if i may uh, I, I i really like to kind of highlight the rabbit holes because i think and i hope that's real i hope that's genuine and authentic um and if i can just sort of speak my thoughts maybe there's some value in hey individuals either having a similar methodology or just knowing that like not everything is going to be a home run 
Uh, it's pretty real to look and say, Hey, we either dropped the ball or that wasn't a worthwhile venture, but you know, it's, we, we have to check, we have to look under that rock and do all the nooks and crannies. Shifting gears a little bit here. Um, you know, they're like you were saying, I guess, you know, that you're taking screenshots of like, you know, these conversations as they actually happen. I think, you know, with the, you know, they call it the businessification of, of, you know, malware and cybercrime, you know, it is, even though it's on the dark web, it is out in the open. Like this is, you know, open source, you know, conversations that are going on in terms of like what's available, how to use it, what to do with it, you know, what data leaks you have. Like there's just gobs of information out there. Um, and, you know, there's things, there's ransomware as a service and malware as a service. Is this, you know, kind of a businessification um, making OSINT easier or making security research easier or is it just making you know the waters all that more muddy and, and complex Ooh. super good question um i think uh, yes and no to maybe an extent because i would agree hey it's absolutely commoditized now it's got that industry it's a marketplace and folks can come and go and if it even it's silly, oh, we say the dark web in spooky terms. What I try to help explain what that is to folks, I'll say, look, it's it's the internet. It is still the internet. You just kind of need to know exactly where you want to go. And uh, you can't go to google.com, but you'll go to c679kl whatever dot onion for however long. Right. Um, anyway, sorry, to your point, it is helpful for OSINT in that, yes, there is a lot out there and you kind of have to sift through a lot of that and that's where maybe some of our automation or ai or those threat intel feeds come and plays a part um but we get to dig through it and we'll do that manual investigation mm -hmm. and i'll say while a lot of it might be open take with a grain of salt some of it could just be spam or scams or just illegitimate and not real to begin with and then another end of it is there are going to be some things that are closed and behind behind closed doors and a private private groups hey maybe pay to play to get access to this this forum or these telegram groups etc cetera, etc cetera. um those things you might need a little bit more of a, a foot in the door however you could make that happen um and with that, hey, maybe the sock puppet is really worthwhile in that case mm -hmm. and maybe you've got the protection and privacy in place but i think slowly building up the building blocks to be able to navigate that is absolutely a valuable thing. Uh, and hey, kudos to, to all the OSINT researchers that do this, because when we get to show this, when I, when I try to make silly videos, I, let, I hope it's shining the spotlight and illuminating that out for a lot of folks. But we draw the point, just like you did, Shannon, it's open, it's available. You can, anyone can go to it, but not all folks have the stomach for it just because that sounds so spooky and weird uh and you get to see yeah the weird wild wacky stuff that's totally not safe for work vulgar and profane whatever's out on the dark web uh so you just carry that with you kudos to researchers and uh, investigators that do all right switching gears again because john your um your name's been uh, i've seen it out there in a, a number of articles literally over the last couple of days um uh, it looks like you've been doing a lot of research into uh, the Screen Connect vulnerabilities. Can you give our audience a brief rundown of, about these vulnerabilities, why they're so bad, and um, why people were really concerned about them? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hey, the last week has been a little bit of chaos. Uh, running around, staying up late, burning the midnight oil, hey, chugging energy drinks to try and chase this big <laughs> vulnerability um, that was uh, CVSS or some of the severity score of 10, the highest you can go. Um, and I'll do a crash course here. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to ramble, so we'll speed run. But there's this software that is often used for like remote monitoring and management to control or offer tech support for a whole lot of different computers. So there was a flaw and a weakness in the server side, which means that if it's compromised and the threat actor would get just point and shoot, easy remote code execution, running a system, you own the whole box, you could trickle that down to all the other connected agents or clients and do that spooky supply chain buzzword. It, but but for real. Um, and there were, hey, thousands. I've, I've seen numbers like 6,000 or 8,000 when this thing was first breaking of publicly exposed vulnerable Screen Connect servers. Uh, but the gimmick was that the exploit was so simple uh 
anyone could do this. There was no code. There was no attack script. You could just open your web browser and over in the address bar, you just add a little forward slash and that'll open the door for you to hey break in and create your own admin account and then wreak havoc. Uh, so we were screaming and shouting about that just to get the messaging out there and try to help the world patch. <laughs> well, I, I saw I saw videos of it and things, you know, where you were showing just, again, since it's a remote desktop, right, dropping files, which I know they were just examples in your particular case, but I assume that could be malware, that could be whatever. Um, so super interesting. Now, since we do talk a lot about here going out and, and investigating things, uh, how, was were you online looking around trying to understand it more or was this more like malware analysis and you're kind of in a lab or were you out trying to understand how it's being applied in the wild who else is leveraging it are there hackers that have already taken advantage of it is that part of the kind of understanding it and getting the word out yes there are a whole lot of different roads to run down uh first is hey recreating the attack chain hey doing the detection engineering mitigation patching messaging etc uh but to your point and i know what's a little bit more interesting for us here is doing that intelligence seeking uh hey maybe some osint and looking around are any threat actors talking about this have the adversaries caught on um and i would try to Hey, maybe in the moment, in the early days, see if anyone is already making some chatter and ha conversing about this. Uh, and at the very, very early point, I hadn't yet, which was kind of a, a good thing in a strange sure. way. That let us get out and ahead of it. Um, <laughs> we've now later onward seen uh, in the wild exploitation, hey, mm -hmm. servers getting popped left and right, and and they'll drop cobalt strike beacons or implants or footholds, and they'll they'll go ahead and install some other access for to maintain SSH, Google Remote Desktop, um, and Lockbit ransomware. In some cases, mm -hmm. we've seen other oh, ransomware yeah. gangs using it. Yeah, well, so th there's interesting nuance, and I don't, we don't need to drive down this if we don't want to, mm -hmm. uh, but the Lockbit ransomware. And I know if you're cool with us opening the can of worms. No, um, let's talk lock bit. Let's go. <laughs> so one of the adversaries and the, the biggest, hey, ransomware gang out and about uh, is, that, is that lock bit ransomware operation. And previously on February 19th, the exact same day as the Screen Connect vulnerabilities coming uh, into the limelight, there was a law enforcement interdiction and seizure and takedown of a lot of lock bit infrastructure. Now, there was a certain amount of drama with that because... Mm -hmm they will kind of go up in arms and say, oh, they only compromised a couple of these servers. We still have our backups. We'll be back up in action in like three or four days. We'll just switch around the source code and we're back in business unfazed. You get to see some of the other adversaries like uh, Black Cat or Alf V, some of the other mm -hmm. ransomware gangs, kind of poking fun, kind of saying, hey, wow, what a weakling. What a, what a, what a, they use a more vulgar word in, in some cases. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's like schoolyard bullying in a really weird way. Um, but what we got to see, because now the conversation is like, wait a second, I thought Lockbit was taken down or at least smacked in the face and they wouldn't be dropping ransomware. So what we observed were some leaked uh, previously available, like to the whole open internet, versions of Lockbit called the 3.0 or Lockbit Black was the name of the builder. And back in 2022, that was just made publicly available because some disgruntled employee, again, human, bringing the, the people conversation in here, they just put it out on the internet and now anyone could be some ransomware gang. Uh, so that is what we had observed. Compiled times, encryptor tooling that was in that timestamp of 2022 timeline. So it's not to say that is real Lockbit or any affiliates. It could just be any Joe Schmo just blowing up computers for kicks. <laughs> well, we've, we've co covered a lot here. You cover so much more on your YouTube channel. Like, I cannot say enough to our audience. Like, go check it out. Um Thank you. Sans, sans your dozens of uh, YouTube videos. Uh, if people are only listening today, what are some of your parting words of wisdom for um, what OSINT can learn from security research or security research from OSINT? Uh, what do you want to tell the folks? Ooh, okay. Uh, I'll try to, yeah, wrap this up with maybe my, my piece. 
uh, I know whether you're listening in, hey, you're tuning into the show here, whether you're already some active participant and practitioner for a lot of these open source intelligence and this cybercrime tracking, threat intel investigations, or you're fascinated and you're interested and you want to learn more and you want to get into this thing. Look, uh, I, if I may be so bold, I'll go out on a limb and I'll say that none of us are experts. And this field is so wide. This field is so huge between everything that we might be talking about. It takes everyone sort of playing in concert. It takes us all working together and collaborating with a certain amount of, hey, held guard to a, some in some places. But it, it means that we could all learn from each other. And uh, I hope that is something that we kind of still bring forward that we're also thinking about this and kudos to all of you that are doing it and active. And I would encourage anyone to dive in. And at the end of the day, you don't feel like you need to be the absolute best or an expert. We're all here to have specialties and strengths and weaknesses, but that's the reason that we work together as a team. Lovely. What a lovely parting thought. Um, I, we just hosted uh, this, this OSINT UP event, uh, and we were just blown away. Like, we know the OSINT community is lovely, but, like, the chat during the show was the most interesting part about it. Yes, the sessions were great, but, like, the conversations that were happening in the sidebar, like, and the information share, sharing, people are setting up, like, Discord channels to, like, go learn together. I'm like, I love nice. all of these That's people awesome. so much. Um, <laughs> last, last thing time for plugs um you have a lot of online resources uh where can people find you well goodness thank you so much uh i am over on youtube you can track me down again just the the name um i am over on twitter i'm on linkedin i i try to do the hey social media thing the best that i can um but <laughs> yeah hopefully that's pretty easy to track down and look don't be a stranger would love to hear from you uh please consider me a friend and always happy to chat well, I will second that in terms of uh, you can find Googling John Hammond or going to YouTube and just plugging in John Hammond, you will find him quick. And and to me, it looks like, again, valuable information. The videos are super entertaining, number one, and cover the gamut, I think, um, whether you are an expert or uh, maybe a beginner for some of our listeners, um, again, whether that's OSINT specific or um, in the in the threat intel world, but it's, it's super interesting stuff. So thank you, John, for being on today. Um, we really appreciate it, all your time. I know it's been a super busy week. You're probably looking forward <laughs> to the weekend. And thanks to the audience for listening. Um, you can learn more about where to find John and his YouTube channel in the show notes. But again, it's pretty easy, just John Hammond. Uh, you can also view transcripts and other episode info in, uh, on our website, authenticate.com slash needle stack. That's authentic with the number eight dot com slash needle stack and be sure to let us know your thoughts on x formerly twitter or blue sky at needle stack pod and to like and subscribe wherever you're listening today or in the future and we'll see you next time